Hi, I'm Laurieann Lacey Cunha, and I'm a senior client partner at Isaiah. Excited to be here at Brand Innovators Ad Week event, and I'm sitting down with Erin Dwyer, who is the chief marketing officer of Matter of Fact. Hello, it's so nice to be here. Nice to see you, Erin. Um, we'll love to hear a bit more about your journey. Um, tell us how you got into this role as chief marketing officer with Matter of Fact Skincare. Sure, um, I have a very unusual journey. I was in ad agencies for a while, then I went to startups, went back to big companies, learned that I prefer small, nimble environments, and I've been in the beauty industry about eight, nine years now. Um, most recently, I was at Way, which is like an incredible brand, incredible okay. humans, yeah, great products. Um, but when I met Paul, the founder of Matter of Fact, I just it just checked every box possible for a dream situation, building something from the ground up, clinical skincare with innovation and patents. And so I joined about 18 months ago and I'm so happy to be here, yeah. Oh my gosh, and since you joined, you've had quite a journey with the brand being a D2C brand and then launching at Sephora. So talk to us a little bit about that. What was it like taking something that was direct to consumer and then having Sephora launch your product? It has been a very busy 12 months. So for those who don't know, getting a product to market in beauty is typically 18 months minimum. Um, and getting into retail is a whole other ball game um, because of the way that you have to manage inventory, the way that you have to manage your prep. You have a whole bunch of store systems you have to kind of educate and prep for. Um, and so it was a big deal. So we looked at everything we had from a D2C perspective. We also kind of opened up the brand and got really close with the founder and spent a lot of time kind of understanding what he really, his vision was, who he really was, and kind of took that, picked that apart and built the brand from scratch. Um, one of the big changes is when you're D to C, you only have to worry about your PDP pages. So you can order a product online, it shows up, the box doesn't matter because you've already made the purchase. Where in an open cell retail environment, people are going up, they're looking at the box, they're asking questions. So the entire merchandising experience is different. So initially the products were made for a D2C system, so we had to kind of readjust the packaging, uh, take a look at the ingredient system, take a look at how we messaged what was unique about it and different when it's next to 10 other products. Um, and then. Because we do so much clinical testing, we were wondering how are we gonna keep that up to date on the packaging? Because packaging's due like nine months before you're gonna go into market, because you have to print it, then you have to put your product together, then you ship it. So we put QR codes on all of our boxes so that we can keep all the clinical data up to date because it's sometimes still in market when we already have to have the assets done. Um, so that's some of the stuff we did to shift from D to C into physical retail space. I love that. And how was that having a QR code with Sephora? What were, how were the challenges there? What were the opportunities? What did you Yeah, learn? I mean, it's funny because I remember 10 years ago when a QR code was like not Wild, cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you know, you had to have an app to, to scan it and now it's finally native into to the camera system. And I guess we can thank COVID for that. I guess that's one of the good things that came out of it. Um, but it, Sephora was initially a little hesitant, right? You don't, when you're in a retail environment, you don't want to take someone out of the retail environment. But these are microsites, they're not set to sell the person they're there to inform. And as we took them through that, they actually really embraced it because it helped their beauty advisors um, be educated on really highly technical information about clinical studies and results. Um, so they're like, oh, it's like a tool. And we're like, yes. Um, and one of the most beautiful stories that I had was um, that one of our field teams shared she was training in a store, and one of the many amazing things about Sephora is they're very inclusive. And there was a person who was deaf, and when she saw the QR code, it like she lit up because it empowered her to be able to communicate with a lot of information to people who may not be able to sign or she may not be able to communicate as directly with. And that was another moment of like feeling really good about putting that kind of information in somebody's fingertips. And so it's a really great tool. That's so empowering. And I think hopefully some other brands will adapt to that too for, yeah. for many of those great reasons that you shared. Now, what are some of the adaptations that you kept in you know, making your products work with Sephora? How has that changed your whole uh, packaging, merchandising? Have you kept your D2C merchandising similar or just adapted everything together? Yeah, it's a going omni-channel is a big move. Um, we were a pretty baby brand, and that was a big shift for us too. So a lot of brands don't get into Sephora, so they've got five, six years under their belts um, of growing awareness. So we're kind of in it with them, which is kind of an exciting experience. But we still love our D2C business, but we know the Sephora customer and the path to purchase there is a lot more frictionless. Um, Instagram has kind of become like direct TV at midnight in the 90s. <laughs> and so that gives us a lot of legitimacy to be at Sephora and those customers are have 
good intentions. They're there with the right purpose to buy. They're highly educated on skincare. And so we really do want to embrace that. It's more efficient for us to acquire at Sephora right now, too. So it's a balance. We can't throw, you know, everything into just one channel, but we're definitely heavily focused on Sephora, which is a shift from when yeah. it was all D2C. Well, it sounds like it's really working and helping you reach new new potential customers. And, yeah. and speaking of reaching those customers, when you're showing content online, whether it's Instagram, TikTok, different platforms, what kind of content's really working when people are seeing your product, being introduced for the first time to get them excited about your brand? Great question. I wish I had like a perfect playbook and an answer to that. Me too. Right? <laughs> and then we could just be like, guys, this is what you do. Um, Solved it. Yeah. I wish, but the algorithm and the way that the world works, unfortunately, that doesn't happen. So we're in a very test, learn, deploy. We had a hypothesis based on all of my team's experience in this industry, and we really thought lo-fi UGC was going to crush it for us, and it didn't. And we're finding some of the more polished content actually works well, too, and we need a balance um, where we've been at other brands where the UGC is just like the number one all the time in advertising and organic, and for us, it wasn't pulling. So we kind of have a an approach to seeing that if it doesn't work, then we pivot. And so now we've got a little bit more hi-fi content out there from the brand mixed with some really hi-fi influencers and then a little bit of lower UGC in the nano space. Um, and so the mix helps too. I think it's important for the brand to have multiple dimensions in their content. Sure. Um, but it's kind of ever-changing. And I think that as the brand evolves and we have more awareness, maybe lo-fi will come in and have a different play at that point. Yeah. And how do you show the results when you've got that 60 seconds, 30 seconds, however many seconds of attention we can have, um, you know, you're using a product, probably takes a little time to show those, you know, great effects on your skin. Yep. What's worked in that regard to, to get people excited? It's a really good question because one of the challenges too is there's a lot of people who dramatic do dramatic before and afters, but they're not from a clinical study. So the lighting can change, the angle can change, um, where we do all ours, in, it's always in the fixed position, and when you take it the first time, there's a machine that says they were in this kind of lighting, this kind of position, so that we can mimic it on the next time that they come in for their photo. Um, so the best way for us to do it is just communicate the timelines. So, you know, it took me many years to get all my lovely wrinkles and smiling lines and, you know, dark spots, it's going to take a few weeks to get rid of them too. Uh, most of our products show results uh, within four weeks, uh, most dramatic usually in six to eight. And so we try to show the, the results so people can kind of stick with it. And our amazing founder and formulator, Paul, his thing is make beautiful products so people want to keep using them. Because if you love using it, then you'll keep getting those results and you'll want to keep kind of progressing. So. Becomes part of your routine. Exactly. You're along for the journey. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, no, speaking of Paul and your company, being an independent brand uh, up against some much bigger brands in the space, uh, how do you approach you know, that growth trajectory from what you're doing, what you're scaling, um, yep. you know, knowing that there are some other companies out there that have been around for much longer and have much deeper pockets. How does that how does that play into your work? Yeah, it's a we will never be able to compete with an Estee or a L'Oreal from a budget's perspective. So we have to be really innovative. We have to be very I don't want to use the word hack, but sometimes that's the case, right? Like TikTok shop just came out and I was sure. like, get on it, right? Because we know they're going to benefit the algorithm. YouTube shorts just launched, get on it, because we know they'll benefit the algorithm for a little bit. So it's kind of being scrappy and finding those little moments to kind of take advantage of um, because we'll never have the huge budgets. And I think it has to do with authenticity and really building strong community. And that comes from product usage. People who use it love it. So then as we cultivate that, um, you know, we've got ambassadors and more grassroots of an approach. So people who come and whether it's a friend of mine or a friend of a friend of a friend who's like, I'm a, I love your product. It's like, tell more people. I'll give you referral codes because that's more genuine than anything else. So we're kind of in that grassroots meets brass tax stage, um, which is a little different than somebody who like a L'Oreal who can do programmatic and Super Bowl commercials. And it's, it's at a different stage in its brand. So it will stick to the U.S. for a while. Mm -hmm. So stay really focused so that your team doesn't get too spread out. And that helps us a lot, too, so we can make the most of the dollars. That sounds great. Well, you clearly know a lot about skincare. You're passionate about this industry. I but if you were to take a step back and, and change and shift gears, either do something a little bit different in marketing or even just you know, advocacy for your time, what would, what would that be? What would that journey look like for you? I have... I have a new life I hope to have someday. So I love what I do. I love this industry. Um, but when I'm ready to sunset out of marketing or the beauty industry, there, I want to support stopping sex trafficking is one thing. Um, I have a lot of feelings about human trafficking in general across the globe. Um, but a big thing that I'd like to do is be in D.C. and not lobby, not be with a 
specific party, but just educate them on technology, the internet, the way that things work. I think that when the cell phone systems kind of came out and you had your first Google phone, you had your iPhone, no one really knew how that was going to impact society, business, and the world. Then you had the social media kind of revolution happen, and no one kind of knew the impact on mental health, connection, um, all of that that was going to happen. And now you're entering a stage of things like AI. And I just think that our government officials need access to education on that, and it shouldn't be difficult for them. And so I'd love to consult and help them learn what those things mean, how it can impact both the economy, but also the society, um, so that we can hopefully get legislation sooner than later. I love that. I think that would be so important to have everyone on the same page and caught up and understand those rules and regulations and those effects. So. Hopefully that will happen. Okay. <laughs> Please Maybe. do. We'll cheer you on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, thanks for sitting down today. It was great to speak with you and hope you enjoy the rest of your summit here at Brand Innovators. Thank you. I had a great time. Thanks. Thank you.